everyone. Hello, Rowan Anderson, and welcome to The Ponytail Show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, um, especially in this very um, interesting time we are in right now. Um, Now, initially, I thought we'd be talking about um, how the basics of living, how because that's that's what I know your work from your books um, from and your blog from Whole Lot of Love. Um, you know, we have in this COVID nineteen lockdown, we have as if humanity has been kind of returning to um, gardening, making things. You know, being self sufficient, and you know this pandemic has kind of uncovered a lot of the cracks in the pavement in government, in the corporation, in in our own, like, you know, our reliance on things um, outside our power. Yep. But your headspace right now, um, you kind of chatted to me just before the podcast and you're really interested in a something which is, you know, the core of being human itself, um, love, compassion, um, you know, more about focusing on the inner self before you can think about, even start to think about the world around you. Yep. Um, so for our audience who don't know who you are, do you want to give us a quick little rundown on yeah. how you got here? Yeah. Um, and And before I do that too, I think... Here is, uh, from my experience, just a snapshot in time because mm. in the future where I'll be at will be completely different and have I will have completely changed. So basically a lot of my story is a focus on change. So in, in the past, let's go back to, say, uh, you know, 12, 12 or so years ago when I started um, my journey started with food and I started questioning where the food uh, was coming from that I was consuming. How was it produced? Uh, what was it doing to my body? And um, I was uh, fairly unfit, unhealthy, stressed out. Um, I had a couple of medical issues. Um, I, I, I lacked having purpose in existence, just being stuck in that kind of corporate grind. And I turned and looked to the past of my life when I was a child living on a farm in Gippsland in Victoria. And I wanted to reintroduce some of those things that I loved as a child back into my life. And that included um, growing vegetables, which my mum had, my mother had taught me um, uh, how to grow vegetables in, on a, in, a, in a basic sense. Um, things like getting back outside um, and uh, having a better relationship with nature. And so I'd started this blog called Whole Art of Love and it was basically just something to document the transition of uh, my attempt to escape the craziness of modern living and the emptiness and the meaningless and the, the, the futility of, of, of the things that were frustrating me in modern life um, and to look to nature for some inspiration, some answers and some guidance. And I found that by growing food, I found that by um, learning to hunt my own wild animals, how to forage. Um, and then with all these different ingredients that I, I had in excess, I had to learn how to cook with them. And, and to exp- then I went on this, you know, I, I don't mind saying amazing journey of learning how to cook. Um, and I, it became quite obsessive. And I recorded this for years and years. And out of that blog and sharing that journey, I ended up um, – quite fortunately being asked to write a couple of books uh, and um, they were based around food and the stories around the food that I was, I was, I was producing and consuming. And I had this amazing period of time where I traveled around the world telling my story um, and running workshops and passing on skills to people. And all of those things are still very much part of my life. And they are like part of the foundation of, of how I approach food and life. Um, but, uh, I also found, but being in that space also, I found it became restrictive and, Mm. and it was the only thing that I was known for when there is so much more learning and experiencing that I was interested in doing 
Um, and so over the last many years, I've gotten back on a motorcycle and um, I travel a lot. And part of that traveling on a motorcycle is is learning um, to be a better human via the experiences that I can have on the road on being a motorbike, by meeting different people, by going through challenging situations on the motorbike with people that I love and adore, um, of spending a lot of time on the motorbike by myself. And and during those those two transitional processes to get to here, now a lot of my focus is um, reflecting on the things that I've learnt over that last very, very hectic 12-year period of my 30s and early 40s. Um, and I have been through some traumatic experiences over the last many years, but I haven't used those traumatic experiences to as a way to define me as a broken person, but as a way to describe um, uh, and 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 embrace the things that I've learnt about what it means to be mm. human. And and from that, the changed person that I was at the very beginning of the journey as an angry, frustrated person who was who saw things in a sense of black and white. There was it was a very um, absolute way of thinking. And now uh, the way I think now is very open minded and, and it, it does a lot of the base um, foundations for how I approach life is is in kindness and compassion and empathy. And and I think in this these challenging times, this is when an empathetic person can really struggle because they can see, you know, the Black Lives Matter situation, the challenges that people have had and the reactions that people have had with COVID. Um, uh, so that's where I'm at. I'm, 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 I'm constantly evolving and learning from myself and, and my life experiences. Um, and, uh, and the future for me is, um, is not necessarily as bleak as what people paint it to be. Mm. I think it's just one big learning experience for all of us. Mm. I like how you brought up um, the idea of challenge and hardship um, on your journey because I feel like, um, you know, without challenge and hardship, we wouldn't have some of the most incredible art that we have in this universe right now. We wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have soul music. We wouldn't have... You know, and that's not to say that um, these hardships are any way justified on a on a whole race level, on an individual level. You know, that's that's the chaos that is Mother Nature herself. And you know, when you're when you don't face hardship, when you when there's a snake in out in nature, you know, you won't know how to navigate your way. Um, about that situation if you don't know yourself if you don't know mm. how um how you're going to react and how to how to navigate through that situation um and that's the thing about um you know this uh culture that we find ourselves in is that we don't as a as a white um middle or upper class um you know group of people there are not many kind of snakes in our That's landscape right. um and yeah. that that makes a very numb culture um and that that makes a culture who is not proactive and willing to act and that's a culture who doesn't know themselves um which is yeah a really interesting idea and i think um we have we have a lot to learn about ourselves in order to move mm. forward. Um, I think too, oh, sorry, yeah, my, yeah. my greatest growth has come from not necessarily trauma but challenging life yeah. situations. When, when you're in a place of comfort, you, can, you tend to focus on the minutia of the, the, the things that don't really matter because there's nothing else to focus on. We're mm. in a place of comfort. Yeah, yeah. When you're in a pl when you're in a place of discomfort, whenever you're challenged, that that means that there's a sense of fear that that uh, that um, can take hold of us, and it does definitely do that for me, where I'm on heightened alert, and and in those situations, that's when I start questioning a situation. What caused the situation? How can I deal with the situation? And all those different experiences, that, or those challenges, challenging experiences. Uh, are 
that's where the growth comes from. That's mm. where the creativity comes from. That's where the great art and the great music comes from. And that's where, as, a, as individuals, that's where we grow. I mean, I remember, I think it was about six or so years ago, a friend of mine was considering, um, uh, you know, that whole trans thing into becoming, changing, changing genders. Mm. And for me, I'd never been challenged with that conversation in a very personal way sense my reaction when I look back on it now was it was inappropriate however I, given time to to work through that um that was a very personal challenge that m opened my mind up to the struggles that a person would go through in that situation mm -hmm. and so and applying those key things of empathy and compassion I eventually got there in the end and that learning experience now uh, you know it is stuck with me for the rest of my life. Like mm. I can't, I can't unlearn that stuff mm. from that experience. So, in a way, those challenges can Im really improve us as people in the way that we deal with challenging situations in the future. Yeah, I think the idea of opening up to something that you're uncomfortable with that makes you feel. Um, like, yeah, you don't know how to go about that situation is actually a good place. It's positioning yourself in a really good place in between order and chaos um, yeah. where, where evolution and growth can happen. I hope, I pray and hope that every generation um, evolves their, you know, their mindfulness and ability to um, have compassion and empathize with people on so many different levels. Um, and I think that is the case. I feel like we're fighting this fight, not for ourselves, but for, for the kids, for the next generation and their kids after that. Um, mm. And like, you know, if you put into context in the, in the history of humanity, we've got it real good life. <laughs> you know, life is real good mm. right now. Um, yep. We don't die at, you know, the age of 30, we have modern medicine, uh, you know, we have so many luxuries in our life that we have access to now. And sometimes this, the feeling that, you know, the, the world is going to, is warming, um, there are so many injustices in society, it can feel very hopeless at times. But I think for me, it helps to look kind of step back and look at the big picture and see how we've evolved. Yes, the struggle continues, um, but I just hope that every generation, um, you know, is able to to learn. And, and one thing I've been really impressed with right now with the um, watching social media, watching reactions, watching the protests in America um, is Generation Z are so full of mm. compassion and I find that mm. fascinating because Generation Z are born into our digital world and they have, they're so, you know, they're born into it that it, it has become a part of their identity and, yep. and using digital um, medias are intuitive to them. But I think, like, yes, the internet has catalyzed the collapse of the Western world as we know it, but the internet can also crack open the hearts of people as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's that weird balance because I was reading, um, you know, the, a bit in, um, in your first book, um, Whole Lot of Love, and, and you, at that point in your life, you, there was a big concern just based on reading the introduction was that, you know, television and media was kind of, you know, numbing the, the mass of society. Do you feel that way still right now? Or has yeah, I, li I, literally, I, I literally wrote a, a paragraph about that in the, a new book mm, that I'm writing at the right. moment, um, how I think, if anything, it's, it's actually gotten worse mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, the the biased reporting that we're getting, the, mm. the political interference that we're having on um, in media reporting, um, uh, and also the absolute mind-numbing trash that is on television. I don't own a television. My dad gave me one um, 
uh, last year and I put it in the cupboard. I just refuse to own a television because commercial television is just full of absolute rubbish. But it, it seems to be the default of what a lot of people, uh, um, they're sub, you know, they're completely subscribing to that rubbish. What mm-hmm. the, the, you know, that the news source or whether or not it's the entertainment. Um, and, and what that does, it's still a very big frustration for me is that that is a massive distraction for people. It, 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 it stops people from being self-reflective. Mm. Um, and I think, I think that's one thing that the, the online community has done a good job of is it, it does, I mean, apart from all the inspirational memes, which I'm guilty of sharing <laughs> at, at, when I'm in a particular mood, um, it, th- there is a sense on social media where people can be at, in some way a little bit self-reflective, even if it's when, when we're picking up bits of news information about the real footage from um, a, a, a BLM um, uh, peaceful protest and then the news will report it a completely mm. different way. And so you can see reality versus um, a vested biased uh, reporting via commercialised um, news news station. Um, and I think that's the hope that we have for for making positive social change is that the people that are engaged truly on social media, I know we've got a, a big problem with conspiracy theorists, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, every 50 years or so, we see massive social change. I mean, you can use that as a, as a you know, uh, from, you know, 1900 to 1950 to 2000. That just within those 50-year blocks, the, the massive amounts of social change that happen. What we're seeing now, I believe, is um, a frustration with the lack of change in, in cultural stuff, say, for the Black Lives Matter, where you've got an older generation that is desperately trying to hold on to it ideals that they grew up in um, because as far as they're concerned that that's the right way and I think this is the issue that we have with a lack of open-mindedness and that's what these younger generations have is it is an open-mindedness and understanding uh, you know um, gender fluidity um, understanding um, the 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 differences in race actually make us more similar to each other than they than, than different and I think that open-minded, open-minded way of thinking is what is going to lead us to that continuation of social change in the future. At the moment, people are just frustrated with that, the lack of change. Um, but um, I definitely think that it's, it's going to come. And I see that hope in my two daughters. You know, I've got two girls, 11 and 14 years old, and it's gotten to the stage now that they pull me up on my way of thinking, and I'm an open-minded person, and they pull me up quite often. If I say the wrong thing, they'll 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 definitely get stuck into me and and kind of correct me, and that gives me hope. And I, I don't I don't would never consider to be a person that would be closed off to the idea of my daughters teaching me because I grew up um, conditioned by a particular society of conservative nineteen seventies, conservative nineteen eighties. And then in the 90s, I kind of felt like we were getting, we were being progressive. Mm. And, and we had this kind of snowball effect of really good social change where even for me personally, you know, you know I began in the eight, later 80s and early 90s as a homophobic racist person. Um, and that's something that I don't like to admit, but that was the, that was the conditioning that we had by society, mm. our parents, our peers, our schools, our, our school friends. And we went through this, I went through this process of, this gradual change and and seeing uh, seeing society and individuals in a different light and a more openness and being more open to different ideas and, and ways of living and and the realities of nature. I mean, homosexuality is a reality of nature. It's not a choice. Yeah. Um, and so I felt I, I kind of felt like we had this great social change momentum. And then in the last couple of years, we've had leaders around the Western world that um, that kind of are so divisive and they in a way encourage nationalistic thinking and they encourage bigotry without saying it outright but kind of it's all very suggestive and they validate the old way of thinking and that's what we've had in this last ugly five years or so where we've had people I mean look what's happened in America America has gone from being super progressive like you know places like California New York as the the and New England as these pro- pro- progressive epicenters of of America and then the rest of America has just kind of gone backwards mm. in a lot of ways of thinking because their leader is validating old ways of thinking um but and I think that's where a lot of the frustrations are coming out of 
yeah. the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is, is this younger generation saying, no, 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 no. We want this change. This is important to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's important for us to going, you know, in going forward. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's really important that you brought up this rise of the of conservative um, politics um, in the Western world um, because it has divided every every nation that has, you know, has become divided um, under conserv. And I wouldn't say not just under conservative um, politics, but um, I think this was brewing in the works much before um, we had our Trumps and our Boris Johnsons and our Tony Abbotts um, mm. in power. Um, do you have any kind of like theories as to why this happened? Yeah, I, often I think about uh, there is a there is a observable fear that people that have privilege uh, are fearful that that privilege will be taken away from them and it needs to be taken away. And I'm saying that as a white male, um, that privilege needs to be taken away. And, and that, uh, that, that fear is what drives bigotry and it, what, it, it's what drives, you know, those comments of going to a supermarket and, um, and, uh, and telling a person that you might hear speaking another language to speak English, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I just want to, I just want to walk up to a person when I hear that and just say, well, you know what, you should be speaking Wadarong because that was the, yeah. orig- that was the language that's been here for 30, 40,000 years mm-hmm. in this particular area. Mm-hmm. So, um, that, that, that is what I think is the key driving thing from, um, and look, I'm going to say it's the older generation, but it's also part of my generation as well. Mm. People in their late thirties and early forties, um, uh, there is a fear of, um, of the unknown and the fear of change. But the thing is with change, it's an inevitability of existence. It's it change is what like is what drives the entire universe. Um, if you look, um, if you look at things like entropy, um, you know, uh, the universe is, is constantly changing and it is changing into a place of chaos. Mm -hmm. It's heading towards chaos and, and will eventually not exist. Um, so accepting that just means you can kind of relax and it's like a burden that is released from you and just accepting that change is an inevitable thing, embrace it. And in that process of embracing change, you can reap the benefits of it. We become more culturally diverse. Instead of just eating, and from a food, a culinary point of view, instead of just eating boring steak uh, and boiled vegetables in an Australian context or burnt sausages on a barbecue, we now have this amazing array of food from, you know, uh, Thai, Bangladeshi, you know, Polish food, but you, anything you can possibly imagine. That's where, that's where I found a lot of those uh, correlations of how one could uh, enrich their lives was by, was via food was, was the discovery of all these different flavors from different cultures. If that culture, cultural diversity didn't exist in a culinary sense in Australia, life would be very bland because Australian culture is fucking bland. It is really, really bland. It comes from, uh, you know, British food, British cooking, and, yeah. and British ideology and, Brit- yeah. and British arrogance. Sorry mm-hmm. to any poms, but, yeah. you know, there's an arrogance. There's an arrogance of, you know, we are, we are a, a more dominant and more intellectually um, uh, Sophistic- superior, superior. Mm-hmm. But, but not necessarily. There's, um, there's a lot of things that I've learnt from other cultures that different ways of thinking that have been far more advanced than uh, an Anglo-Saxon way of thinking. Mm. Um, and I mean, I remember one time I was um, uh, was in Italy, and uh, a taxi driver, and I was there with my my uh, ex wife and, and uh, two year old daughter at the time. And this this taxi driver took me aside. I didn't know this guy, but this was so important to me. He took me aside, grabbed me by the hand, and he said to me, "You look after your wife," and he said, "Always respect your family, and um, you know, and love your wife." And he, he gave me this little lecture, and I was like. That was part of his culture. He was passing that on to me to mm. respect my wife and respect, you know, and to love my family and to, 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 to value my family. Do you know, that, that experience never once happened in Australia by an Australian person, never once came up to me, one touched me on the hand as a complete stranger. 
and told me these important things for, you know, as a guide to life. Mm. I mean, that was a, that's, that's experience has stuck with me ever since. Yeah. Um, and of course I knew those things, but it was lovely to hear it so passionately spoken to me by a 60 year old Italian man that thought it was important to tell me about these mm. things. So I kind of find that this is the beauty in diversity mm. and, 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 and being closed minded and, and not wanting that diversity, I think, um, is just super limiting. Yeah. Um, yeah, when, let's go back to, um, talking about nature because I, one thing that, I could really relate to you in your kind of journey experiencing with in experience with food, growing your own food. That's embodying ancient wisdom. That is embodying something that is using your body to act out something before you can fully understand the wisdom of it. And I think that's really going back to ancient wisdom going back through history to learn from it is something that I'm you know that's my process of how I figure out the world and um yeah like one thing I can observe um having grown up in Australia having grown up in many cultures but um experiencing um the Australian culture as something that was a very like you know I I grew up in Australia so um it's a very modern culture. It's a new country. It's only about a hundred years old as white settlement in yes. Australia. Um, and therefore, you know, there are not, there's not that history and old passed down values that, that exists in the culture. I mean, and it was completely destroyed, um, the Aboriginal wisdom and that important heritage and you know, generational wisdom passed down and morality. I think the word morality is very important mm. as a foundation of a culture. That kind of was a bit lost, I found, and I didn't really feel it. Another thing I felt was that I went to school in a in a postmodern school context. Um, the university yeah. that I went to was a very postmodern approach, so... The postmodern university culture is, um, okay, let's take an example. You have a house and you want to have, you want to renovate it, okay? Yep. Now, the postmodern way that you renovate your house is by burning it to the ground and walking away. That yep. is burning down the foundations of what you have in your head and just walking away. So I left university absolutely, like, completely confused about, you know, my purpose in life. I came out of university, you know, kind of being very um, critical of all the systems that I saw in place, but having no kind of, like, solutions or, mm. you know, steps forward. Um, whereas, you know, what I think is the, the real purpose of a university is – to renovate that house in partnership with its owner and, yes. you know, breaking parts of it down and reforming it in a, in a functional and beautiful way. Yes. Which, which I think is a big problem that we're seeing in the university um, system right now. And um, we also have to be very aware, especially for you know, for the, for the next generations that um, even in high school, the schooling systems are essentially an agenda put together by, by government. So, yeah. you know, it is also not just a parent but a society but a culture's responsibility to nurture children and educate children in a very multidimensional way. Um, and yeah. that means acknowledging ancient history, acknowledging learning about Marx and how, you know, millions of people were killed in Russia during um, Stalin and how, you know, Mao continues to oppress, uh, you know, the, the Red Book of Mao continues to oppress yep. in China. And yep. these are things, you know, when I see um, very kind of left swaying thinkers and you know romanticize marxism 
it it disgusts me because you've completely ignored a huge portion of history, you know, yeah. that you've pushed under the rug. Honestly, in Australian high school, I didn't learn anything about Russia or China, which is such an important... That's my grandma... My grandparents um, fleed from China, um, yeah. you know, from, from that period. And um, people continue... And, you know, another thing that's important to acknowledge is... Um, the fact that this history is not acknowledged um, means that we can't move forward in a meaningful way. I'm going to give you an example. Yesterday I went to my hemp supplier in Thailand. I went to visit yep. her. She has her own farm. She's been doing this for 20 years. She, she, far, um, she grows industrial hemp. And um, she gave me an example yesterday of um, an order she got from, from an Australian fruit growing company. Um, for hemp bags yep. and they wanted to put their fruit in these hemp bags they wanted something sustainable uh, yep. you know something high vibe and good they placed the order she started producing them they didn't um, they hadn't given her a deposit then when the bags were ready she contacted them and they said oh we found a cheaper option in China so we will not oh. be paying for this order that that she wow. forked out to produce. So a company who wants a sustainable, you know, packaging for their product, you know, when you look into really what's going on is they just need that label. Oh, hemp That's tick. Right. But we, yeah. won't, we don't care if it's produced in a, a government subsidized factory in China where um, minimum wage is not... Where, where there are the trade of Uyghur Muslims um, uh, going between different factories, there, there are, like, incredibly, you know, really unkosher practices in China. Yeah. But the world has, has used China as their manufacturer um, and yep. just for purely for profit Economic. margin, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing that I discovered when you're talking about that, that, that going back to nature and looking at the old ways, that's what I discovered with food is that, at, you know, 12 years ago, the food that I was eating had no soul. So I would get reheatable meals from the supermarket. I would get pre-made meals, or pre-made sauces, pre-made things in tins that I could just, you know, uh, pan fry some chicken and pour some things over. So there was no, there was no substance, quality or story or purpose or it was just shallow food all produced for economic benefit for the producer um, and a, a, this so-called level of convenience for the consumer. Mm. And so for me going, look, at, I looked to the past of how, how do I get this dish if I do have all the things, all the processes myself, from growing the vegetables, from raising the chicken or from hunting the deer for, you know, you know, making the stock. Um, and so once I began to uh, uh, learn and embrace all those ancient processes that are completely taken out of the system now, the food started to taste better. Mm. Life became more enriching. Um, and I think that's, kind of a similar metaphor for this situation that we have now where, like you're saying, a company wants to have the appearance of doing the right thing mm. ethically um, and morally, but it's a big load of shit because to do that to a small producer and say, no, we've got a better deal is a, 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 not only highly unprofessional, but where's the morality in that? And and for the, for the consumer that is purchasing that fruit in that Chinese made hemp bag. One of our problems that we have in our society is people do not ask enough questions. Yeah. How was this produced? Who produced it? Who was, who was disadvantaged in the production of this item? And for a lot of us, we just don't care. Yeah. And we need to care more. We need to go through those processes to say, you know, what impacts does this purchase of mine that is a cheap purchase, what impacts does that have 
on the environment, on other people, on our climate. And we have gotten to such a comfortable place in existence in Western culture that a lot of people don't ask the questions. And as soon as you start pointing the finger and saying you should start asking questions, people get offended. Oh, yeah. Like you're, you're, in, you're invading their, their way of life. Mm. Um, and I think that was one of the things that I really, really enjoyed during the COVID, the beginning of COVID lockdown, was the supermarket shelves being stripped. As frustrating as it was for me, I was okay to survive because I'm not as reliant on supermarket mm. food as a lot of other people. Um, but I loved the discussions that I was having with people how frustrated they were and how scared they were that this this easy and efficient supply of shit food that was no longer there and it scared people. And people then would have discussions with me and say, do you think things will change? Yeah. And I'm, I'd like to say yes, but the cynical pessimist inside of me says, you know, things are going back to normal and already you're starting to see it at, you know, when I visit the supermarket, I still I go there to buy basics of, mm. of you know, di different items. But, you know, you just see things are going back to normal and people are just strolling along buying things and filling their trolleys full of the most non-food food products there mm. are and not thinking. And so if that if that is happening in regards to the food that we're purchasing – it's also happening in regards to our other purchases, whether they be all the electronic items that we, we just love and buy and, and, and that are disposable or the fashion that we buy that's disposable. I mean, still, I was uh, having a chat with a friend of mine the other day who, who um, he got photographed in New York and he flew me over there to photograph his wedding. And while I was over there, I bought this jacket and it was a really well-made jacket. Um, and because I was in America, it was something that was manufactured in Mexico, but it was mm -hmm. the quality is just fantastic. Um, I have been wearing that item of clothing for like 10 years now and it's still serving me well and there's other items of clothing that I'll get that, that aren't produced very well and they're probably being produced in horrid conditions and they don't last. Yeah. So there, there's value in, in the old way of buying things to last and that, that was the thing that I looked back. I did this study on marketing and, and uh, advertising uh, from, say, the light, late 19th century and early 20th century, and a lot of the advertising was, this product has been built to last. And then companies realised that that's not actually economically viable because people don't yes. come back to buy more replacement items. And so manufacturers have gone to finding cheaper options that won't last forever, and then we have this issue with a vacuum cleaner that only lasts you a couple of years, and then you've got to go buy a new one. Yeah. Um, and that's this whole capitalist system is this cyclic use of of human resources and also natural resources and it's it's not sustainable i mean mm. we can kind of laugh at it and say you know that the the human culture is doomed but it's going to there's going to come a point in time where we're just going to have to say we really need to slow down this yeah um when and how that manifests, I don't know, but I'm ho I hope I'm around to see some of that change happen. Mm. Well, yeah, there's so many interesting points you brought up there. Um, part of the reason why I started this podcast was initially I wanted to uncover a lot of like um, of this kind of of the incredible force that is corporation in the fashion industry and how how crippling it can be for the whole supply chain. And the best example for that is, unfortunately, um, one of my factories that I use in Vietnam that I've been using for five years um, is forced to shut down because of, um, well, it was a gradual process um, of being squeezed by larger brands, large corporations, and not having enough of the small brands who were, who are ready to pay high prices um, to manufacture their goods in small quantities at good quality. Yeah. Um, and during this crisis, a lot of the large brands who were, who were using um, the factory I was using in Vietnam just cancelled their orders. Um, and, you know, it was absolutely crippling to the factory and there weren't enough small brands like me to keep it afloat and therefore... Yeah. Um, you know, that's hundreds of jobs just um, gone. And there's no accountability on the other side of the world 
um, for the corporation, for the big companies, big brands who just decided that, you know, things are a bit tough for them. So they have the right to just cancel their orders or not pay their invoices. Um, yep. And like my, in my observation, um, I feel like there are not, it's, our governments have made it very difficult for small business. Simple as yeah. that. Small yeah. business is expensive, it's painful, and it sucks the life out of you. And the government mm. does not reward you in any way possible. And back in the 70s, um, you know, small business was able to balance out um, cooperation and create a very healthy, you know, economy, but that that is no longer the case today. Um, I don't know if yeah. you've heard of a guy called... Um, Oh, Robert Reich, um, he was actually the, the Minister of Labor for Clinton. Um, but right. he, he has a fascinating book called Saving Capitalism. I really yep. recommend it. Um, and he recently or also turned it into a Netflix documentary. Um, yeah, but right, okay. he, he is a great, you know, fit to, you know, the economy is not about money. The economy is about people. That's and right. And that's something we've forgotten. We've completely forgotten about. Um, and um, so I think we need more. We just need more perspective. We need more small business and we need like government to stop giving tax breaks to corporation and, yep. and help, you know, help their own people by creating small community-based thriving economies um, yes. that are self-sufficient and, you know, and can cope in, in times of crisis. Um, yeah. Yeah. I found that too with, um, with the wine industry um, in Australia. There are what is supported on a large scale um, – the quality of a lot of those wines is question, questionable in a you know in a wine sense. Mm. Uh, there are there is a just like in the craft beer movement, there is this growing, you know, not craft wine movement, but natural wines. There's um, uh, low intervention wines, and there are a lot of young enthusiastic winemakers that are making a diverse range of different wines, exploring different techniques, minimal intervention type of stuff. And so not only do we um, – uh, it's not just about people and it's not just about supporting small business. It's also about promoting diversity. Mm, and then, yeah. then the, people, the people that produce it are supported, but also the people that consume it have more options and – uh, a more enjoyable experience when it comes to, say, food or wine or fashion. I mean, this is the thing about Australia's textile industry in the, in the 70s and the 80s. There was more diversity. There was more options for mm. you to choose from in terms of fashion, whereas now I find, um, I mean, I, I, get, uh, I get absolutely frustrated in terms of buying clothes because the options of of the type of clothes that I want just don't exist in Australia. Mm. Um, and so I tend to buy certain items from other countries because they'll last longer, they're better quality, or I'll just buy secondhand clothes and yeah. hope for the best. Um, but, uh, but I'm always looking for something that is different to what is offered on a larger scale. Mm. And, and small businesses, whether they be a small fashion label um, or they be a small winemaker – they offer me the things that I want mm. and that's uniqueness, somebody that's put something together with passion and love and respect and they've honoured the process. Um, and you can tell the difference. You can go into a, in, in terms of a food sense, you can go to a, uh, a cafe in, you know, any city in Australia and you can get the same boring, bland menu because it's all come from, say, PFD distributors, which is the same truck that delivers all the same type of pre, you know, pre-made food um, and, you know, tomatoes in, in winter, which is ridiculous, yeah. um, a pre-made guacamole and all these things that are kind of, they have no soul, they have no flair, they have no excitement. And then you go to a cafe where the MO of that, um, the chef that works at that cafe is they want local, they want in-season, mm. they want fresh, they want organic, blah, blah, blah. The 
the the experience is so observable and so enjoyable. Um, I can't understand why people would go for the bland cardboard. Everybody's got the same type of stuff um, scenario, as opposed to the uniqueness of you know eating something that you may never have chosen or you may never have thought you'd eat before, uh, and also eating it at its peak in its season. You know, the asparagus are in season, so that's going to be on the menu. It's like amazing as opposed to eating asparagus in from Peru yeah. that's been delivered to Australia in, you know, something like February or something. It I mean, was it just, picked too early anyway. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't, it just doesn't have that, you know, uh, eating everything in season just makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, that's, and that, that, that's an ancient way of doing things. And that's where I respect so many different cultures, whether it be in a food sense, whether it be Thai or it be French or it be Spanish or, or Maltese, it's eating things in season at their peak means that your life will be more enjoyable. Not only are the, on top of that, there's all these other health benefits. I mean, you, mm. you know, you, the nutritional the nutritional density is going to be, uh, you know, m- much more improved if you're eating something that's just been picked recently as opposed to something that's been in transport for a couple of weeks yeah. and, and, been, and had to be treated so that it could stay kind of fresh. Um, but all these basic principles uh, – can enrich our lives, whether it be fashion, food, wine, or whatever. But what drives the decisions that are made in corporations? It's all, it's not triple bottom line. It's all, it's all economic. And I say that because I used to work at Coles Meyer head office um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I used to work for a record company as well. And uh, decisions are made around how our corporation can ensure that the shareholders are taken care of. Yeah. The decisions are not made to ensure that the suppliers of that corporation or the manufacturers that supply the suppliers are they looked after. I remember there was a couple of situations where the buyer that I was working for at Coles My Head Office and we were buying for all of the Kmarts in Australia and it was Sydney 2000 Olympics time and one of the suppliers had, had – um, the buyer had signed off on this, you know, some cheesy merchandise set of glassware that was going to be sold at all Kmarts in Australia. And then the, the buyer decided that they, they got a cheaper option, and it was exactly the same scenario that you were talking about before. This supplier that was from a Melbourne company that, that got their, their – they had all their pro- product manufactured in China – they just had their order cancelled, which they had confirmed. They had outlaid that money, started the manufacturing process, and then the entire thing had to be, was ground to a halt. And I remember sitting at, in the meeting there being so uncomfortable when my, when my buyer, who was my boss at the time, just pulled this out of left side. And I just looked at her and I was like, you're basically going to ruin this. This is going to put this guy in the hole. Mm. Not only that, that people, but all the people in China that are making that product. Yeah. Um, and the flow-on effect, but that, she didn't care because it was about maximising the margin of what of getting it from another supplier cheaper so that by the end of the month or the end of the quarter, she would report a better profit for the shareholder report. Yeah. That's what it was all about. It wasn't any consideration to the environmental implication. There was no, environment, there was no consideration to the people implication. It was just all about money. Yeah. And until that mentality changes, and I think – I think corporations attempt to embrace that these days, but they're dismally failing. It's, it's the small to medium-sized businesses that are doing a far better job because they can be malleable. They can react to different situations. They can take and, – and I say a lot of those small businesses, the, the risks are actually higher. Oh, much higher, yeah. Much higher mm. um, because, um, you know, uh, it, a lot of the time it's a personal investment or, you know, even if it, it, there's only a couple of investors, so the risks are higher. Absolutely. But the, the gain is better because there's that thing of, we, you know, of that morality of yeah. like what is important to us, how are we producing this thing, what matters to us. Well, it's, it's just, more than just money. Yeah, it's just very short-sighted to be thinking about just money. Um, but, um, well, Robert Reich would argue that, you know, we cannot leave – the responsibility of morality to corporation, it is the job of the government. But um, since, you know, especially in the 90s, there was a big shift um, in government where, um, you know, lobbyists from different industries started to kind of sway the way that government was run. Um, I think 
Robert Reich was, he was in some kind of consumer control body um, in the government, which um, responded to, um, you know, the, the failures in the moral compass of corporation. Yeah. Um, and that was very quickly shut down because it, it just lacked funding and lobbyists basically ruled um, king. So Washington, the way that Washington um, function changed very drastically and now we're in this mess. And I think this happened, this definitely happened in Australia as well. Um, so it's really time for, uh, one thing that I I did get hope from speaking to Belinda Bags last, um, last week on the podcast was people can make a difference. Um, it does feel very like you're swimming an uphill or you're running an uphill battle, but um, she, her, you know, she um, was part of a huge campaign to save the Australian bite um, from oil drilling and yeah. um, they were successful in stopping um, stopping that from happening to the Australian bite. Now, whether that stays protected is another battle that they fight, but I think, like, my hope is just that more people get involved and this conversation happens um, more on a widespread uh, um, across the board and people stop being so fragile about these kind of dialogues. It's not mm. about which team you're, you're fighting for or you're playing on and it's not about putting someone in a team. I, I like to identify, I identify myself as, as a centrist where I, I think two sides are essential to making good mm -hmm. decisions um, and yep. people get real freaked out when they can't fit you in a box. Um, yes. So I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of angry argument in society right now, but it's probably because we haven't been talking enough. Um, That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have this um, saying uh, when I engage in conversations with certain people on the left, and I would say I'd be, I'd be, I'd be central leaning to the left in a lot of ways of thinking. Um, but the situation we have, and I think it's born out of a sense of frustration, is that we have people that um, uh, have been opened to being informed about certain social issues, whether we're, you know, all the things that we've been talking about. And they're so informed and they've got very, very hardline formed opinions that mm. they become aggressively progressive. Mm. And Absolutely. it's almost impossible to engage with these people because even though they think that they are so open-minded and their way of thinking is, is, is perfect because it is so far left, it actually discounts any other ways of thinking. And I think it's always important to be open-minded and also understand that everybody is in a different place of understanding certain situations. They may be at the very beginning where they haven't even considered that there's an issue they may be at the very beginning, a little bit further along where they they know that there's questions, but they don't know what questions to ask. And then they could be all the way at the end where they're very, very knowledgeable in a certain, in, in a certain topic, but they, they, um, they still question themselves. And I like, I'd like to be at that place where mm. I'm always questioning myself. But I think regardless of, of that way of thinking, I do believe that the responsibility – and it's the same thing about not being absolute about this. There's so much grey area. It is the responsibility of corporation. It is the responsibility of government. But in more importantly so, it is the, it is the responsibility of consumers. We are the ones, whether it's food, fashion, absolutely anything. Do I need to make this new purchase of a car? Do I need this new robot vacuum cleaner? Mm. Do I need this electronic po popcorn machine? It is, the, it is the responsibility of the consumer to be a better consumer. Mm. And, and what is one of the big underlying issues and, and the problems that we face is that consumers don't want to be engaged. Yeah. Um, and it's, a, it, it's, it's constantly, um, it's, a, it's, it's a thing that constantly goes through my mind. I mean, I have a secondhand couch that I bought in a case of emergency because I'd moved out of house and I needed to buy an, a, a couch and I literally bought this disgustingly ugly black leather couch. It serves a purpose, but it is from an aesthetic point of view, which is something that is important to me, it's ugly. And every time I look at it, and sometimes I sit on it, it's not that comfortable, I'm like, I really would like to get a new couch. So I fell in love with this new couch. It, the, the new couch is beautiful. It's got this beautiful tan leather. It's a three-seater. I could fall asleep on it after too many pinots. It's just a gorgeous couch. 
it would make my ugly house seem beautiful in that one room, you know? And then I'm looking at the couch. I'm like, who made this couch? Where has this couch come from? You know, how long is this? What's the quality of this couch? Will this couch last? I've been debating this couch purchase for nine months. Mm. And you know what? I probably won't buy the couch. I'll probably just stick with a crappy couch. Um, I, I had a, a similar but, situation where we, we did a one-year couch deliberation before we went and bought our couch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah same yeah. thing. It, but it's like, it's like um, uh, I think we need to do that with a lot of our purchases. Mm. And I think um, uh, you were talking about this, this lack of understanding of, of nature a little while back and I was speaking to my partner the other day about the fact that I lament that you can get pretty much any Australian that was raised in Australia or even had a period of time living in Australia, take them out to their local bush area, whether that be on the edge of a city or out, out in the bush of their, within their state, and ask them to identify certain flora and fauna. People cannot. They can get the mm. basics. Oh, that's a magpie. And they'll say crow. And it's not a crow. It's a raven. But mm. they'll, say, they'll identify one or two things. But this, this massive array of things uh, in nature that people cannot identify because it's not part of our culture to learn what is what is sustaining us, what is around us. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing for food. It's the same situation with food. You can walk into any supermarket in the Western world and, and ask 10 or 20 people what season particular vegetable is in. And because that vegetable is on the supermarket shelves, most people will say, now. And it's not the case. Eggplant's not in season at yeah. the moment. Neither are tomatoes or zucchini or squash. But they're on the supermarket shelves because they come from far north Queensland. And so people just aren't asking enough questions of, of the, the, about the things that they consume on, yeah. on all platforms. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we are just out of time, but this was an awesome conversation. It feels like it needs a part two. Um, for people out there who want to hit you up or follow or get figure out what you're about, how do they do that? I would probably just go to Instagram these days and it's just uh, uh, Rowan Anderson, under, underscore Rowan Anderson, underscore. Awesome. Well, thanks, Rowan, for your time today. It was really awesome chat. No worries. Thanks for the talk. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>